recording for online students. Probably none of you are going to say your social security number or anything, but just be aware that anything you say is going to be picked up by a microphone. And now we can start doing mathematics. We're not going to dive right into calculus. We have some prerequisite sections we want to cover. But even before we do that, maybe we should ask a question, which is what is calculus? Because as I sort of said yesterday, I think maybe a lot of people have only a very vague conception of what calculus is and what it's used for. And if we're not going to dive right into it, we can at least dive right into that. And calculus can easily be summarized as the mathematics of change. It, hold on just one second. So calculus is the mathematics of change. It was kind of famously, well, I can't say invented by Isaac Newton. There was famously a very ugly priority debate over who should get credit for inventing calculus. But Isaac Newton is often credited as one of the inventors. I mean, he definitely is one of the inventors of calculus. And I mean, Newton was doing his laws of motion at the time. So he was looking at how things change over time and he was trying to put that on a mathematical footing. So calculus is intended to study how things change. If something is falling, how quickly is it falling? Would be a very mundane but easy to understand application of calculus. And calculus is used in almost every field of human study where numbers are involved, it's often used kind of behind the scenes in various programs and algorithms. But you know, how quickly is a population changing? If new if wolves are reintroduced into an area, how will the deer population change? If we can increase the vaccination rate, how will the COVID infection rate change? Just all of these day-to-day -day policy decisions can be studied using the tools of calculus. So in this class, we're going to try to provide the foundation for that. <clears throat> And as I say, we're going to start kind of ingloriously. We're not diving right into calculus. We're going to review some definitions from algebra. But even if it's not very exciting, these definitions are important to get down. You're going to struggle in this class if you don't have the notation really down pat. So let's start from the beginning. And let's look at functions, and especially let's look at function notation. Because the major definitions of calculus, or at least one of them, is given in terms of function notation. What is a function? Well, you see in definitions by now, let's just understand it kind of informally. A function is a rule that takes inputs, come on, there we go, and maps them to you unique.
out books. And the word unique, I'll come back to in a moment. But for now, let's just give a very basic example. You could have, for example, a squaring function. That takes an input and gives as its output that input squared. So such a function, for example, would take the input two and output four or it would take the input negative three and output nine and so on. And in this class, we are primarily going to be working with functions. I've said that calculus is the rate, is the study of change, the mathematical study of change. We can narrow in a bit and say that calculus is the study of how functions change, almost exclusively. Still, we can give an example of something that isn't a function. I said I'd come back to this word unique. Let's consider the following rule. And this rule is going to be kind of contorted to write down, but it's going to take an input and it's going to output, no, it's going to take a number as its input. And it's going to give as its output all the numbers whose squares <coughs> are the input. And as I say, when I write it like that, it might not be totally clear what I mean, but I think an example will clear things up. This rule would take four, for example, and it would output two, because two squared is four and it would output negative two because negative two squared is four. And what you'll notice about this rule is that our input of four is giving us two out. It's giving us two and it's giving us negative two. And jumping back, the word unique means one. Something's unique if there's only one of them. So this rule is not giving us unique outputs. It's giving us more than one output. Ergo, This rule does not describe a function. And as I say, aside from maybe one set, one section, maybe two sections, we're going to be spending all of this class looking at functions. And the thing we probably want to nail down next is function notation. I mean, it's probably pretty obvious that what I've been doing on the board isn't very elegant. I'm writing out things like input, 
well, I'm writing out things like this, that an input is sent to the input squared. There's the squaring function, but it's not in very nice mathematical notation. I have the word squared written out instead of using the squaring symbol, for example. So let's look at some notation. And again, this will be review, but it's really important for the next few sections, at least, that we have this very firmly nailed down. Our notation for a function, we give it a name, normally F but we can use other letters as well. G and H are common. And in the parentheses, we have our input. And our input is given some sort of name. And the most common thing we call an input is X. But it could have another name. T is a very common choice if your input is time in a word problem. Equals some expression involving the input. So going up here, let's look at a take a function that takes an input and squares it. We'll call the input x here. If we're calling our input x, then the input squared is x squared. And our symbolic notation for this function is therefore f of x equals x squared. If we go back a few sides, this statement that the squaring function sends two to four can now be written symbolically as f of two equals four. So what we have over here is the output, and what we have there in parentheses is the input. And we should do a little more with this. Um, does anybody have any questions so far, though? Then let's keep looking at this. Let's say we have a function, maybe something slightly more complicated than the squaring function we've been looking at. Maybe we have a full on quadratic x squared plus x minus 2. And we have some input. We have some input that we're interested in. Maybe we're interested 
in plugging two into this function and seeing what happens. Well, the idea here is that if your input is two, your input is x, and this x over here is the same as the x on the right-hand side of the equality. So we write f of two, we're replacing x with two everywhere it appears. And again, this two in parentheses is the input of the function. And what we have over here on the right is the output of the function and two squared plus two minus one is just a number. I mean, we can simplify it. Two squared is four plus two is six minus one is five. So when the input is two, the output is five. In culture this, we are very interested in inputs other than numbers. We're very interested in being able to work with and simplify expressions with slightly more complicated inputs. So that's what I'm going to show you next. Let's say we have some function. And again, I'm just sort of making these functions up as we go along. They don't really mean anything, but let's say we have a function f of x equals x squared plus x. So this function takes an input, it squares it, it takes its square root, and it adds those two things together. What we're going to be very interested in for the next week or two is inputs that aren't numbers but our expressions of the form x plus h, where h is some constant number. And these inputs are dealt with exactly the same way that numerical inputs were dealt with back here. So back here, we replaced x with our input, and over on the right, we replaced x with our input. So there's nothing different here, just because we have a more complicated looking input. We'll replace x with this input in the parentheses. And then, we'll replace x with this input on the right-hand side too. To get the expression f of x plus h equals, we replace x with our new input. So x squared, becomes x plus h squared. And then again, 
we replace x with our new input. So the square root of x becomes the square root of x plus h. And we're, as I say, we're going to be messing around with expressions that look like this. I keep saying for the next two weeks, which is wrong. We're going to be doing something else for the next few weeks, but then we'll come back to expressions that look like this. So since this is sort of our prerequisite section, let's take a moment to try to get used to this. Let me do an example. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to pause for a moment, and I'm going to ask you to do a similar example. Let's let f of x be x squared plus x plus one. That's fine. And let's simplify as far as we can f of x plus h. The finding part, well, here, this x plus h is our input. We're going to deal with this exactly like we did one frame before. Everywhere x appears in this expression, it's going to be replaced with x plus h. So we replace this x with x plus h. See, here we go. We replace this x with x plus h. So x squared turns into x plus h squared. We replace this x with x plus h. And this one remains a one. Any question about how I got that? Is this familiar to everyone? <laughs> and let's try to simplify this a little. And sometimes what's simplified is kind of a judgment call. Like, is a quadratic more simplified in its standard form or a factored form? That's not always really clear. But I'm going to interpret simplification here to mean that we should foil out this x plus h squared. And this is often when people struggle in calculus, it's not so much the calculus that gives trouble as kind of algebraic errors. And it's funny because Often, people who, or students, I should say, who know how to foil 
or something like this, we'll still see this and think x squared plus h squared. Students who, when they see this, know that you have to FOIL, will still make that kind of freshman error. So let's not be careful not to. x plus h times x plus h is x times x is x squared x plus h outer x times h inner h times h last. So if we are careful to FOIL, x squared plus, you see we have two xh's, we have an h squared, and then <coughs> we have all of this, the x plus h plus one. And it doesn't look like this simplifies further. There are no like terms we could combine is what I mainly mean by that. So we'll call this problem finished. Does anybody have any questions about this before I ask you to do another very similar simplification? <clears throat> and that's just sort of making something up. We'll keep with the quadratic theme, maybe, <clears throat> 2x squared minus x plus 3. And what I'd like you to do is the same thing I just did. I'd like you to find and simplify f of x plus h. And I'm going to sort of circulate, resume recording, um, x plus h squared is still x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Now, a little caution here. This is the kind of sort of minor mistake it's easy to make. And then you get sort of to the end of the problem and nothing is working out the way you think it should. This minus x plus h gives you a minus x and a minus h. And then to finish things up, we simply distribute that to. And once again, nothing, there are no like terms to simplify, nothing is canceling. There doesn't seem to be anything more we could do to this expression. So we'll say that it's pretty simplified, as simplified as it can be. That's, um, well, first of all, question. Did any did anybody get any get something else and not know why? So everyone agree with this. Then let's keep on sort of with this theme. 
it might seem like the problems I'm doing are sort of very arbitrary, as if I'm just selecting stuff to throw at you at random. This is building to something. It's going to take a little while before we see what it's building to. But let's do a problem similar to the one we just did. But that's sort of, that's a plus one. Let's sort of um, go a step further. Let's find and Let's simplify f of x plus h minus f of x. So we're doing the exact same kind of thing we just did in the previous two frames. We're finding f of x plus h, but then we're doing something else as well. We're subtracting f of x. And of course, we know what f of x is. So we're subtracting 2x squared plus 1. Let's run through this. Um, so it's going to be f of x plus h minus f of x. So minus 2x squared plus 1. And that's if I could have just a little room up front. We need f of x plus h. So, sorry, I know from, I'll try to sort of squeeze in here so that I'm not blocking this side of the room. Two times x plus h squared plus 1. So we're finding f of x plus h, just like we did in the previous frame, the previous several frames. And now, just for space reasons, let me do this in my head, because we just found two times x plus h squared. So this is very similar to something we just did. Two x squared plus four x h plus two h squared and then we have a one. And again, I kind of rushed through that, but I rushed through it because if you're copying everything down in your notes, we've already gone from here to there in a previous problem. And now stuff simplifies further. You know, in the previous two problems, I found f of x plus h, I foiled everything out, and I said, well, it's about as simplified as it can be. There doesn't look like there's anything else we can do. Here, there is more stuff we can do. Because this negative sign, is going to distribute over this addition. We're going to have a negative 2x squared 
and we're going to have a negative one. Let me write this out. 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus 1 minus 2x squared minus 1. And now you see perhaps some cancellation occurs. We have a 2x squared minus 2x squared. So those terms cancel each other out. Positive 2x squared and negative 2x squared cancel. And similarly, we have a one and we have a negative one. Positive one minus one cancel. And when the dust clears, we're actually left with a relatively short expression. The only things that survive these cancellations are 4xh plus 2h squared. So everybody feel good about this? Any questions? I guess we'll find out very shortly whether you feel good about it or not, because I'm going to have you do something similar. We'll maintain the quadratic theme. Quadratics are relatively straightforward to work with, so they make for good kind of classroom exercises. Let's say x squared plus x minus one. And I would like you to find and simplify f of x plus h minus f of x. Again, I'll circle the I don't want this problem to go on to the next frame. This minus sign is going to distribute over everything in the parentheses. Minus x squared, minus x, and then the minus negative one is going to be positive one. So let me... minus x squared minus x minus negative one will be positive one. So what happens? Well, we have x squared minus x squared x squared minus x squared is zero. So we have that cancellation. Then we have x minus x. x minus x is zero. So we have that cancellation. And then we have negative one and positive one. And negative one plus one is zero. So we have that cancellation. And we're left with two x h plus h squared plus 
much. And we're not done with section 1.1. I want to keep going with these. I want to add one final layer of complexity where there's a division step at the end. And also, although most of you have presumably seen the domain and range defined in, you know, high school or somewhere, I'd like to define the domain and the range. But keeping with what I said yesterday, that I normally try to keep Tuesday, Thursday classes about the same length as Monday, Wednesday classes, that is to say 50 minutes, I'm going to adjourn. And I will see all of you remember at 9 a.m. tomorrow.